Good morning, good morning. God bless you all, those of you who are listening today. Well, I come with an incredible teaching today, uh, which was recorded uh, when I had the privilege to travel to Nigeria uh, in a men's meeting. Uh, 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 and uh, I want to tell you that the Lord really ministered uh, not only to the hearers, but even to myself. And I give God praise for this message. It is entitled, In His Image and Likeness, God is After Himself. I pray it will be a blessing to you, and I pray that you will be edified by it. Have a listen to this. I extend uh, a greetings to all of you in the mighty name of Jesus. And uh, this afternoon, I want to share with you about God and about man and God. And men's ministry is a passion of mine. And I know that I won't be able to get into certain areas, but I know that there will always be another time that we will come together again. But today, I want to share with you about being in the likeness of God. Because that's part of being in his order. And so we want to just turn just very briefly just to the book of Genesis, um, chapter 1. And as we're turning there, let me share one or two things with you. In every relationship or position which the believer may be in, the secret of happiness lies in the maintenance of the divine order. We know that God is a God of order and he expects us to abide in divine order. Whether it's in the family, the household, the church or community, if there is any failure to uphold God's order, then the consequences will be very severe. And as men, we have a responsibility to abide in the order of God. The reason why there is so much chaos in the world that we live in is because we have stepped outside of God's order. But in everything that we do, we need to do according to the plan and order of God. And I will emphasize this by saying to you, God is a God of order. God doesn't deal in rubbish. Whenever he does something, he does it well. There is always a reason why he does what he does. There is always an order why he does what he does. And when he does it, he does it well. And whenever he gives us anything to do, he expects us to do it well. Praise God. So we need to keep those thoughts in mind. Also, we need to recognize that in every generation, our God raises up men to set things right in our societies and in our communities and in our nations. Our God raises us up to bring order out of chaos. Hallelujah. Elijah, he confronted the nation of Israel and he came against the prophets of Baal. Praise God. Moses was the chosen deliverer. Joseph became the Prime Minister of Egypt. Abraham became the father of a multitude. Glory to God. Samuel was the first judge of Israel. David was a man after God's own heart. Praise God. Gideon was a mighty man of valor. Hallelujah. Isaac was the promised seed. Jesus paid the price and died for all. Hallelujah. Paul preaches the gospel all over the world. James brings a hard-hitting message to us all. Barnabas was one of the greatest encouragers in the New Testament. Peter was a powerful preacher of the gospel. So we are no different today. God still raises men to do his business in the societies, the communities, and the churches that we live in. Praise God. Now when we look at the book of Genesis, chapter 1, and we look from verses 11 and 12, the Bible says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, 
and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its own kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And the Bible says it was so. He then said, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after its kind. And God saw that it was good. This is in Genesis 1. And God saw that it was good. But the words that I want you to keep in your spirit is to notice whose seed is in itself. And every seed was after its own kind. Praise God. Now in verse 21 the Bible says, And God created great wells and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly. And again he tells us, after its kind. Now I want you to keep that in your mind. We're going to go through this. I want you to keep that in your mind. After its own kind. Praise God. And God saw that it was good. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. Praise God. And cattle after its kind. Now you notice that everything was after its kind. Praise God. Each seed would grow its own kind and it would reproduce itself. Hallelujah. Now the Bible then goes on to say in verses 26 to 28. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Now I'm going somewhere, so wait to follow me. Now the Bible says God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now it is important that we read these scriptures, because what I'm going to teach you today is just a part of this message. But I want you to keep the scriptures in mind, and keep the thought everything after its own kind. Everything. Number one, God wanted something to pour himself into. So what did he do? He breathed into man and man became. Praise God. And then, and so after man becomes, God gives man a part of himself. And that is what he wants us to replenish the earth with. He wants us to replenish the earth with who he is in our lives. Everything after its own kind. Praise God. In other words, when we look at this, we get a picture and we begin to understand that God is after himself. Praise God. God is after himself. The Bible makes it clear that he made he, he, he put the cattle after its own kind, grass after its own kind, animal after its own kind. Its seed was in itself, and so it was able to do what? Reproduce itself. That tells me, glory to God, that God is after himself. What he, when he looks at me, what does he see? But he sees himself in me. Everything after its own kind. Hallelujah. Praise God. Everything after his own kind. And the Lord God, the Bible says in Genesis 2 and verse 7, formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Hallelujah. And man became a living soul. Now can you imagine? God brings something into shape from the dust of the ground. The shape this body was uninhabited, it was empty, but it was ready to receive something. So what he had formed, he breathed into, and we became. Hallelujah. Man, you and I as men are set apart as a minister 
from the very first day that we are created. God has already ordained us to be ministers of who he is upon this earth. Hallelujah. That means that we have to affect our society, our families, our household in a good way. God does not deal in rubbish. Hallelujah. God is after himself. When we begin to look at Genesis chapter 3, we're going to look there, verses, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. We're going to read that in a moment. God's own creative power was breathed into man. And man was not, and I want us to understand this, man was not created to be in conflict with God. We were not created to be in conflict with God, yet alone with one another. Or any of his creations. But we were created to live in harmony with a good God. Hallelujah. A mighty God. A wonderful God. Hallelujah. We were created to live in harmony. Genesis 3 verses 8 to 10 says, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam. He noticed he didn't call Eve. The Bible said the Lord God called unto Adam. Because Adam had the responsibility to make sure that the house was in order. But the fact is that he now came out of order and he stepped outside of the will of God. And God had to pull him up and question him about what had happened in the garden. He didn't call Eve. He called Adam because Adam was given the responsibility to take charge of that garden and not to eat of just one tree. When you consider all the trees they had in the garden, one tree, God said, do not touch it. Isn't it amazing we always want what we cannot have or what we're not supposed to have? You tell a young man not to drink, he wants to drink. You tell him not to smoke because it's not good for you, he wants to smoke. You tell him not to do drugs. What does he want to do? Do drugs. But every man is given a responsibility to take charge of his own actions. So God called Adam. Didn't call Eve. Not that he wasn't interested in Eve. But Adam had the responsibility. And every one of us, whether we're married or not, all of us have a responsibility to ensure that when God looks at us, he sees himself in us. Hallelujah. And Adam replied back to God and said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Sin was knocking on the door. And after sin separated man from God, Adam saw his unworthiness. And when God came to meet him at the cool of the day, he didn't even repent and say, sorry, Lord. But he blamed God for giving the woman to him. It's the woman that thou gave me, he said to God. It's easy to blame somebody else for your actions when your back is against the wall. But when God gives man a responsibility, he expects us to carry it out. And I know one thing, that in my household, my wife never questions my authority. And the only reason that she does not question my authority is because I spend time with my God. She knows I hear from him. She knows when I'm feeling something, I pray to my God and God will speak to me and I will speak to my family. So she doesn't question my authority. If she has any doubt, she takes it to the maker. But she never stands up and says to me, you did not hear from God. Because of my relationship to him. How tight are you with God today? How close are you with your maker? How close are you to the source of life himself? The same God that wants to see himself in you. How close are you to him? When he looks at you, does he see himself? Or does he see something else? Father, we give you praise. But in all the separation, and in all the mistakes that Adam made, God was still after himself. Hallelujah. He didn't change his mind about you and I. He didn't repent and, 
and say to himself, I wish I had not a made man. His intention was and still is to see himself in us. God, it's a God. Matthew 3 and verse 17. The Bible says, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And Matthew 17, 5 says, and while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowing them, and, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Why is it that God could look down from heaven upon Jesus? And say, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Why is it that he could do that? He could do that because he saw himself in his son. He knew that his son wouldn't let him down. He knew that his son would walk the earth and be obedient to his call upon his life. He knew that his son wouldn't go to the left or to the right, but will just keep his focus upon the task that God had given him. So he was able to look down and say, this is my beloved son. How many of us can he look down on today and say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. i like God to say that about me. What about you? I'd like to know that God can look down from heaven and say, yes, you are doing a good job in your household. You are doing a good job in your church. You are doing a good job in your community. I'd like God to look down and tell me that. How about you? How about letting God see himself in you, in your actions, not just by word, but in deed. Hallelujah. When God saw his son Jesus and said, this is my beloved son, he said it because he saw himself in his son. Everything after its own kind. Hallelujah. Everything. Glory to God. And I want to share with you some qualities of being a man. And these are just some. I'm only giving you a taster at this time. This is the sum. One of them we focused on over the last two days. I've been our bishop, have been sharing with us about fulfilling the vision. Hallelujah. Number one, the qualities of being a man is that real men must have vision. Every man must have a vision. Whether it's a vision for your community, whether it's a vision for your household, whether it's a vision, you could, you could go into a desert place as our beloved bishop was sharing with us about the man who, who went out and bought and, and built Las Vegas who became the gambling state, a man who went into an empty space and bought the land that people must have thought he was mad. But every man must have a vision. Every man must have a vision. I have a vision for my family. I do not want to leave this earth knowing that I have not done my best to ensure that my nieces, my nephews, my daughter are walking with the Lord in the light of his word. I want to leave a legacy of anointing for them. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the blessings of heaven. But every man who says that he is a man must have a vision. God places that vision in us. Real men can see the truth in situations. They can see with God's eyes. Hallelujah. They can see people as they really are. Unfortunately, we live in a world today where people are more appreciated for what they have and not for who they are. That's the kind of world we live in today. You have plenty, then you, I will be your friend. That's the world we live in today. But I want to be appreciated for who I am, not for what I have. Who I am, I'm a servant of God. Who I am, I'm a, I'm, I'm a prince, hallelujah. My God is so rich indeed. I need nothing as long as I'm serving him. Praise God. Do not write people off because they appear useless. They know that every child, every man knows that every child of God is their brother or sister. That we live in a competitive world today. Men against men, every time. 
But our God is not interested in that. You know, our God is interested that we are obedient to him. Because when he called Adam, he knew where Adam was. But he called him because he wanted him to give an account as to what happened. And all of us will have to give an account one day. Wouldn't it be better to be found doing his will and having a vision for your life and for the lives of those that come after you? Hallelujah. In Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 it says, Let us throw aside every weight and entangling sin and let us run with the vision that God has firmly placed in our hearts. Glory to God. So the qualities of being a real man, number one, real men must be men of vision. You must be able to see further than your nose. Let's not be selfish with what God gives us. Hallelujah. Number two, real men train and they train hard. When I became born again, I was so excited. I took out every book that I could find to read. I opened up my Bible and began to pray, God, show me your stuff in this book. I went to see what kind of authors I could read about. I went to college. I did this. I went. I did teaching training. I did everything I could possibly do so that I could know who this God is and who I serve. And as a man, you need to train hard and be seen to train hard. And let your children know that education is important. Education is important. Education gives you more choices in life. And I love what God does. Let me give you a little picture. Because I love what God does. Isn't he amazing? Egypt was a very busy country. In the early days, they set up schools. They were the ones that put papers together so that people could write and do letters on them. They were the nation of their time. And isn't it amazing how God prepares the way for his people? Because when Moses came along and they decided that they would kill all the men child, Moses was put in a basket. Who found him? The Pharaoh's daughter. She took him to Egypt where Moses was trained. Do you think that was an accident? God planned it. God cannot, he can use whoever he wants to use. But when you are educated, God can use in a way that he wants to use you. Moses was a well-educated man. And by the time he grew, God then began to speak to him, this is what I want you to do. Hallelujah. And he sent him from Egypt back into the wilderness. Because God wanted the Hebrews to be trained properly. Didn't want them to be novices. Didn't want them to be useless or stupid. Education is important. Even if you did not do well at school, that doesn't mean that your child has to turn out like that. No, sir. Education is important. Real men will train hard. You don't understand something, find somebody to explain it to you. You don't know, ask the question. It's not a sign of weakness or vulnerability, but it will take you to the place where God wants you to be. I question my father all the time. There are some things I don't understand. I say, God, I don't understand. It does not make me vulnerable. And it doesn't make me weak. But when God sees my eagerness to learn, hallelujah, he's going to continue to pour upon my life. Men, do not be afraid to ask questions. Do not be afraid to talk to one another. One of you may be cleverer than the other. You help that individual. Don't look down on them. When I was growing up, people used to look down on me. When I first came to church, people were looking down on me because I was asking questions. I wanted to know. We're all at different levels of learning. I wanted to know. I was hungry to know. And I still continue to ask. And the reason why I know what I know is because I ask questions. If I'm not sure about something, I will ask. Doesn't make me any less of a man. 
Real men will train hard. How our, our, how our, our spiritual disciplines do it. Spiritual disciplines are how we train for battle. But some of us don't even pray. Some of us don't even spend time in the world. But as a child of God, you and I have a responsibility. God, we took up to know more about him. That's our responsibility. I can tell you as much about God as I know. But you need to know him for yourself. How are your disciplines, your spiritual disciplines? Do you pray every morning? Do you study your Bible every morning? If you're married, do you bring your family together so that you can pray together and have your devotions together? How much time do you spend with your wives? Do you sit and share with them? Real men train hard. You train hard, you win hard. Glory to God. Father, we give you praise. Third principle, real men are brave. Brave. And I say this with a heart that says, when the enemy comes against you, you stand up against him in the name of Jesus. I'm not talking about having a bravado attitude. I'm talking about being brave in the word of God. Being brave enough to use the word of God in every situation. Being brave enough to take the word of God and bring it into your situation so that you can turn your situations around. Some of us are so frightened to say that the word of God says this. But my Bible says I must be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. Be brave enough to stand on the authority of the word of God. Hallelujah. Fourth principle. Real men will sacrifice. Hallelujah. I would do anything for my wife as long as it's under the anointing of God. If anybody called me anything, they're going to hear from me. Anybody troubles my family, they're going to hear from me. But I will sacrifice so that my God can be seen in me. Hallelujah. If Jesus was able to sacrifice his life, glory to God. We need to learn. That means sometimes we have to give up time. You know, sometimes, you know, in the UK, many men, husbands, they will spend hours on the computer, just internet, surfing nonsense, rubbish, not even studying anything, just sitting there and just playing games. And their wives are inside thinking, when is he going to come? Is he not going to sit down and watch a television show with me? Is he not going to come and spend some time with me? There are some men, unfortunately, who are doing these things today. And wives are crying out for their husbands. All the wives want from their husbands is a husband. Yeah. Yeah. Someone who will love them. Someone they can feel secure with. Someone they can trust. And some men will stay away from their wives deliberately. I worked with a guy many years ago when I was a, when I was a manager at Bank Xerox. And every time overtime came up, he was always the first one to put his hand up to do overtime. This man was married and had two children. And one day I had to question him. I said, don't you like going home at night? He said, no, he's, he's fed up and he's bored with his wife. And the reason why he would work around the clock is because he didn't want to go home to his wife. And I shook my head. And I began to share with this man. I said, what problems are you having at home? And I began to exhort him. He's not a Christian, but I exhorted him anyway. And I said to him, you need to do better than that. If things are not going right in a relationship, you need to talk to your wife. I said, when was the last time you sat down and had a conversation with her? Never spoke to her. Never told her how he felt. Never told her why he felt the way that he did. And there are a lot of men, husbands, who are doing that today. And they say that their wives don't understand them. But they never talk to their wives. I talk to my wife all the time. One of the greatest things that I love about my wife is that she knows when I'm ready to talk, she has to drop everything. Because it'd be a long time before I talk again. But when I'm ready to talk, she will drop everything. Maybe she's cooking, all the fires will go up, and she will sit down and she will hear me out. Because she knows when I'm ready to talk, it all comes out. That's the kind of relationship you need to have in your household. So we must sacrifice at times. Sometimes we're, we're bored with stuff. Sometimes things happen, but we can do something about it. Real men will sacrifice. 
Not only for our families, but for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the fifth principle is that real men will know the meaning of kindness. When was the last time you were kind to your wife, to your children, to your friends? To the people that you associate yourselves with in your churches, in your community? When was the last time you showed kindness? Some men are so hard-headed and stubborn. God doesn't want us to be like that. Jesus came and showed us love showed us how to be gentle just because he turned the tables over in the temple doesn't mean that he was a bad man sometimes you have to discipline but you discipline in love glory to god we must know the meaning of kindness and i want to emphasize this kindness is not weakness it doesn't cost much to be kind just a smile and a shaking of a hand or a hug or an embrace. It doesn't cost much to do that. If Jesus could do it, so can we. And he came up against the vilest offenders. <laughs> Glory to God. Number six, real men don't complain, they fix. We don't complain, we fix. When we know that something needs to be done, we do it. You made a promise to do something, you do it. But don't complain when somebody comes on your back. When you know that you told that person you were going to do it and you hadn't done it. Never complain, just fix it. If you can't do it, then get somebody in who can. But get the job done. Because God always gets the job done. Father, we give you praise. There are the six, seven principles I've given you there to work with. But I want to share something here as I, as I come down. And I want to go back to the scripture that we had read earlier about being in the image and likeness of God. Because there's something else that I need to drop into your spirit right now. I'm going to read this verse again from Genesis 1 verse 26. And the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Glory to God. Ephesians 5 and verse 1 says this, Therefore be imitators of God, copy him, and follow his example, as well-beloved children imitate, imitate their fathers. You'll find that in Ephesians 5 and verse 1. Now, the creation of mankind is very significant in the times that we are living in. Because it is here that God creates a creature that is higher than the animals, and that is, high, and that is a little lower than the angels, which possesses a special likeness to him. Glory to God. Man is a being that God has developed that is capable of developing a personal, spiritual and functional relationship with him. The personal relationship that spirituality bonds us with God is extremely unique. And I want to drop this into your spirit because I believe that this is very special to us today. Image and likeness, they complement each other in a powerful way. One that I had never seen before. But as I began to read the scripture and God was showing me some stuff, I began to do some research because I wanted to understand about image and likeness. Hallelujah. And I don't know about you, but sometimes you want things to make sense, don't you? You know, you look at stuff and you want it to make sense to you. Like when it makes sense to you, you want a better position to explain it to somebody else. Glory to God. So they are, image and likeness, they complement each other. And I wanna, I'm going to help us just to define what this is meant. An image of something is duplicative in nature. For instance, a statue is made in the image of a person. Or a person who paints a portrait, paints that portrait in the image of the person they are painting. Glory to God. Now, I was looking at Pastor Joshua today and his son. And his son is the splitting image of him. When you look at his son, you can see Pastor Joshua. Glory to God. Now, 
One of the amazing things that I love about God is that the Bible says that we are made in his image. And people are still trying to understand what this image is. But the image that God refers to is spirit. The Bible says that they that worship God must worship him in what? Yes. And in truth. glory to God. So it makes sense that the image of God in man is the spirit of God in man. Glory to his name. It makes a lot of sense. Father, we give you praise. So the image of, of the image is the existence of man as a spirit. It is the equipment that God has given us. In other words, God has given us the capacity to be Godlike. Not to be God. Hear what I'm saying? Not to be God, but to be Godlike. Because all he wants to do is see himself in you. Now, likeness is a very different kettle of fish. Now, my father and my older brother, they look like each other. They're the spitting image of each other. If you see my brother, you will see my daddy. If my brother, now my, my father, one of, the, one of the things my father is, he is a great man. We had ups and downs over the years, but we have a good relationship now, but he is a great man. He taught me the importance of family. Because my mother left us when we were quite young with my father, four of us, three boys, one girl. My father was the one that raised us. We gave him a lot of trouble, but he still raised us, taught us the importance of family. My father is not a thief, he's not a drunkard, he's not a druggie. My father was a decent, is a decent man. If my brother went out into the shop and stole something, and he was caught. And one of my relatives, my aunties or my uncles would come to the house. They would say to him, why did you do that? Your father is not like that. But he's still in his image. He still looks like him. Nothing's changed. The difference is he's not operating like his father. He may go out and steal. But my father never stole. He may go out and drink, but my father never drank. But the image is still the same. Hallelujah. So it behoves us to understand that we have a missing link in the lives of men today, in that we are not operating in the likeness of God. However, we are still in his image. The image has not changed, but we are not operating in his likeness. Jesus came to restore the likeness of God back to us. Hallelujah. That means that when I accept him as my Lord and Savior, I need to now begin to operate in the likeness of my Father. Hallelujah. That's the difference. The image never changes. When God looks at us, that never changes. He sees himself. But what is missing is the operation of the likeness of our Father. And God wants us to operate in his likeness. The Bible says he gave us dominion, rulership, hallelujah. He gave us the right to dominate the earth. God gave us that right, but we are not operating in his likeness. Sin has perverted what God had ordained. But the image is still the same. That's why he loved me so much, because I'm still in his image. I may be sinning, I may be making mistakes, I may be going down the wrong road, but the image is still the same. And all oh God, is, he's, got that, he's up in heaven and he's weeping for me to come back and begin to operate in his likeness. Hallelujah. And I want to encourage us today. Do not remain in the position that you are in now. But begin to get to higher heights and deeper depths in God. Hallelujah. And begin to understand his plan and purpose for your life. Oh, praise God. All God wants us to do is to operate in his likeness. We are already in his image. We are a spirit housed in a body. When we go to heaven, our body dies. But we need to begin to operate in the likeness of our God. Amen. Bible says you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall. That is operating in the likeness of our Father. Hallelujah. You shall drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. Operating 
Bring up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Operating in the lights of God. That's why you need to bring the word of God into play in every situation. Glory to God. Father, we give you praise. We give you praise, Lord. And we magnify your name in all the earth. Hallelujah. I'm going to just conclude with a few things there because I want to just pray for you before I finish. Father, we just magnify your name for your word to us today. We pray, Father, that we will take heed to the call that you have placed in our hearts and in our minds. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to say to us today, what is your desire? Do you desire to operate in the likeness of your God? Is your desire to serve him with all your heart, mind, soul and strength? What is your desire today? The Bible says Enoch walked with God. In Genesis 5 and verse 24. And he not walked with God and he was not he was not for God took him. Is your desire to be like Enoch today? I want to walk with God and do what pleases him today. Hallelujah. Enoch walked with God. He constantly set God before him and he walked pleasingly before the Lord. He acted as if he were always under the seeing eye of God. His life was a life of communion with God. Enoch walked with God. Enoch made God's word and promises his rule and always glorified him. God's word was Enoch's rule of faith. Enoch walked with God. And I'm going to have to stop there. We just stand and we just pray. What is your desire today? Is your desire to operate in the likeness of God? You are already in his image. You already look like your father in heaven. Hallelujah. But let's begin to operate in his likeness today. Well, praise be to God. What an incredible teaching. And listening, listening to it again actually really blessed me. I pray that it was a blessing to you. And I pray that uh, you will take heed to the word of God today. I pray God's blessings upon you. And I pray that <laughs> if you are struggling at this time in understanding who you are, I pray that the Lord of heaven will reveal himself to you in such a powerful way that you become a new creature in him. I pray for a turnaround in your situation. I pray that the Lord will open up the windows of heaven over your life. I pray you will draw near to him so that he will draw near to you. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your heart and mind in and through Jesus Christ. Until next time, amen. <laughs>